Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. back to A Fork in Time. Don sitting in the host chair today, joined by a show contributor and, 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 and show now has been both a host, he's been a lead host and a guest host. I've, I've got Chris Capola here. Chris, good to have you again today. Hi, good to be back. And today we are going down the path of exploring another one of the suggestions that actually came from one of our listeners. And in this case, it's Joey Gibson who had suggested, I guess he, he gave this to us in early January. And so I'm just going to try to basically read his suggestion here, uh, Chris, and then we can sort of set up a little bit on the historical what did and obviously get into the historical what if, since that's what we do here on a fork in time. So um, he talks about the fact that when Ho Chi Minh, first Ho Chi Minh approached Woodrow Wilson during the League of Nations, uh, this was actually during, I guess, the, the Versailles Treaty negotiations mm -hmm. following World War I, to talk specifically about Vietnamese independence, and he was ignored. And then later again, after World War II, Ho Chi Minh reached out to Truman and White House aides never gave Truman a letter that Ho Chi Minh had drafted. And so Joey's question for us to consider on a historical what if here is how might history have been different if either of those had turned out differently and if the United States had approved in some way of assisting Ho and uh, other forces with Vietnamese independence. So that's what we're going to look at today is our historical what if is we're going to look at an alternative response by the United States at one of those two points. We may, may do both mm -hmm. when we come back from the break here. What would have happened if either Woodrow Wilson or Harry Truman had given a different response to the attempts by Ho Chi Minh to involve the United States in Vietnamese independence? So we'll pick up that topic after the break and we hope that you join us when we do. Alexis and Don taking just a quick break from the podcast here. Normally, this is where we would have an ad or a, a, a mention. I think that's the, the inside term that we're supposed to brand mention is what they're called, at least on the website when we're, when we're loading an episode. But today, I'm just going to directly appeal for one of the other ways that you can help the podcast where you may not get as much directly back in return as we do from the others, but still something that's important. So, Alexis, what is Patreon? So Patreon is a platform where actually you can go and support the podcast that you love, including A Fork in Time. Yeah, and it's not just podcast there. Patreon is probably the number one um, platform for artists and, and folks who have various things to be supported on. So podcasts frequently are there, but it can be YouTube channels. It can be the other things that are there. But basically it's your opportunity to become a subscriber or a, uh, a patron, hence Patreon, uh, for the show. So here at A Fork in Time, uh, we do have a few patrons and we appreciate them. It doesn't cost a tremendous amount of money uh, to put on a podcast, but it does cost money. And so over time, one of the ways that you can help us defray the cost of the podcast, we've been able to use some of the money to upgrade the equipment that we use. Hopefully you notice that from time to time is actually by supporting us on Patreon. So Alexis, how do you, how does someone find how to support us on Patreon? Just go to the link in the show notes. You'll see a Patreon link and click on that and you'll get all set up. Yeah, the other place you can go is actually to our website, which is www.aforkintimepodcast.com. There's a Patreon link there, as well as other non-monetary ways that you can support the show. Uh, Alexis and I have said this a number of times. We did not start a podcast to retire on. Uh, it's not that lucrative, particularly not a niche podcast about alternate, alternate history. history. Uh, but, but still there are costs in doing that. So if you can help us out either through financial or non-financial means, we certainly would appreciate it. And we appreciate again, the fact that we have built a global audience of what we think of as being our little community. And so we invite you to be a part of that. Anything else you want to say about that, Lex? Just thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Welcome back to A Fork in Time, the Alternate History Podcast. Don joined today by Chris and we're looking at Joey Gibson, one of our listeners' suggestion, particularly about a different outcome for Vietnam. It's not like Vietnam had any impact in 20th century world geopolitics or anything, Chris. I mean, it was just it was it was a blip, right? Not not more than one not more than one major power had any problems there, right? No, not at all. And yeah. 
it, 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 <laughs> I mean, you know what? The music was better. I got to say that, right? Um, you're talking about for the U, the U.S. Yeah. version of that yeah, versus the, the French v- yeah. versus versus the French version I, of that. I am not that up on French popular music, to be honest with you. So that is a blind spot I have. I, pop- I if I'm being honest. French yeah. popular music in the 1950s, Chris. Yes. I hereby uh, commission you to go and uh, get some more knowledge on that. The internet, the internet's a wonderful place. Somebody and, knows and, about it out and there. And by the way, if we're talking about world powers, the funny thing is, uh, just nationality wise. The Germans were actually in Vietnam in a large extent. They were just wearing French Foreign Legion uniforms. So, gee, we got a lot. There's more powers than even were officially there. That's correct. (laughs) Um, And, uh, you know, there's there's that famous line. uh, One of the things you don't want to get involved in is a a land war in, um, I believe it's in Southeast Asia. So, uh, you know, this has been talked about before, but, you know, Vietnam is an interesting nation for a number of reasons. And we're going to explore the historical what if here that Joey Gibson, one of our listeners, has suggested, you know, but to me, one of the most um, most interesting things about this is um, as an American and, and thinking back, you know, from the American perspective on the Vietnam War, of course, I immediately start thinking about, you know, the, the, the 50s moving into the 60s, but we're really talking again, as we were talking about here, we're talking about something that goes much further back and goes back into more of the, the colonial history of Asia. And the French play a big role in this all the way up until 1954 when uh, they eventually are dismissed because of DNB and food. So, uh, and even more so because in 54, we kind of inherit from the French all of the decisions they had made. Right. And, and, and many of those decisions were not the type of decisions that you probably wanted to endorse or inherit if you were really thinking them through. Right. And, um, you know, so the question that's raised here, specifically staying on point for what the listener has suggested, which is there are two instances, probably the, the more famous of the two instances is the first instance. So this is right after World War I, when Ho Chi Minh who, by the way, had lived and worked in the United States. I believe Boston was the area that he had uh, he had been here during a period of time when he was being schooled here and then worked here as well. But uh, one of the things that's pretty well known, actually, um, I think it's David Halberstam who wrote a, a good biography of Ho that I remember reading in college, uh, was talking about that. You know, we tend to th- when we when we tend to think of, of of the Viet Cong, we tend to think of the Vietnam conflict. We think of you know sort of being anti-American communist. But that's not where Ho started. No, not at, at all. all. And no. so, in you know, in 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 1919, as World War One is coming to an end and uh, the Versailles Conference is going on, uh, we actually talked about this on a, on a recent recording, another episode. I know Wilson, we've talked about frequently on episodes where you've been a part of it. Chris is Wilson had some pretty lofty ideals that he took to Europe with him in terms of after World War One, right? He did. He did. Um... Yeah, he had lofty ideals. I'm going to add this for Europeans. Okay, fair enough. Um, if you look at, you know, at, uh, I, I'm reminded of, I want to say it was Clemenceau, who upon being presented with Wilson's 14 points, which were the, you know, 14 things, the, the war aims of the United States. These are 14 things that we want to see come out of Versailles his initial reaction was God only needed 10. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And and that's, you know, Wilson was a professor. He was, not only was he, not only was he a professor for anybody who's, you know, been to college, he was that professor in every sense of that professor. Um, and and he had these wonderful ideals about people being able to determine their own future. I stress for Europeans. Right. And in fact, if you actually look through the, you know, the 14 points themselves, they are very specific about Russian territory. And this is what should happen with Belgium. As you said, it was very Eurocentric. I guess that's a yes. fair way to describe it. Yes. But there, there was a concept in the concept that was sort of contained behind the scenes was this idea of of national self determination. Yes. So, so it was the idea that you know the, these territories ought to be able, the people that are in these territories, ought to be able to decide for themselves. 
who they are to be, how they're going to be governed, what form of government, et cetera. That was the big idea. But as you, you pointed out, I think very well there, the application of that in the 14 points was, now let's look at specifically at some European examples here. Yeah, yeah. And, and also just, you know, looking at who, uh, honestly, who Wilson was and where Wilson came from, he very much viewed the world as almost a, a pecking order. And certain people were adults. Cert and when I say people, I mean certain people, certain nations, certain groups were adults that should be allowed to rule themselves. And there were others that to his mind might well have been meant to be ruled. Right. And so, again, it also just struck me here all of a sudden, the, the, very, the treaty is the Treaty of Versailles. Versailles. Yes. So the treaty is happening, by definition, it's Versailles. It's happening in France. France. And, and so, you know, obviously much of, the, much of the war had been fought, you know, in French territory, obviously, as well. We're talking about World War I, the European aspects of it. So the French are still, at this point, a colonial power. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah. so, so, so wh where where do we find the French scattered at this point? As we get to the end of, they're on they're on the winning side of World War One. So, where do we find the French scattered around the world as a colonial power? <clears throat> Martinique, Guiana, West Africa. Um, well, Southeast Asia into Tahiti into other parts of Africa. They, they, if it wasn't for the British, they'd be the, they'd be the ones we talk about the sun never setting on. They were that, kind of number two. That, that was the, the thing that way. popped into my head is they're like, uh, they're, they're the, we try harder empire of, um, of that, you know, that it, similar footprint globally, just not quite. And, 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 and by the way, this is an interesting thing crossing my mind right now of like the, colonial administration and, and the footprint of, you know, what it means to be ruled by somebody. The British were kind of laissez-faire about things. And as you go lower and lower and lower on the scale of, you know, we're, we're an empire, you get to like Belgium and the Congo where they got something to prove. Right. <laughs> but, yeah. So one of the territories here is what is known as French Indochina. Now we yes. don't, we, well, eventually we will call Vietnam, but at this time it's still called French Indochina. So the French have been there for quite a while. And so Ho uh, being someone who's looking to end the colonial possession of, of, his, of his nation, mm -hmm. of his homeland, uh, has this idea of sort of seeing what Wilson says he's standing for in terms of self-determination. Uh, being in the United States, an admirer of a lot of things American, from everything I've read and understood there, this idea of, you know, this is, it's a unique time, this war has just been fought, there's this idea of self-determination that's out here, now is the time for me to see if they're really, you know, they're willing to put, you know, um, to do what they say they're going to do, you know, put, put some action behind their words, and so the idea of approaching Wilson to see if the United States would favor independence for Vietnam. That's what I understand uh, from the, the, the question from the listener and what, what I understand about my reading of history and doing research on this. That was what Ho thought could happen. Do you think I have a fair summary of that, Chris, or did I miss anything there? You're absolutely right. Um, just, just to add a little bit of color here, um, what is Ho Chi Minh doing in France at this point? He's, he's a dishwasher in a restaurant. <laughs> right. And, 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 and so this very much has kind of the, I, I, I just kind of close my eyes and picture, you know, a dishwasher, like trying to push his script on a studio executive at a Hollywood restaurant. That's kind of what's going on here. Like, like he is not a dip. Ho at this point is not a diplomat representing Vietnam. Correct. He is somebody who, you know, would like Vietnam to be independent. And so he's, passing this stuff to the president of the United States. He's a dishwasher. Okay. Which, as a rule of thumb, is not normally where most large dip diplomatic thrusts come from, correct? 
Right. Absolutely. <laughs> and he's also not at this point yet a communist. No, not at all. Not at all. He he was a nationalist. And you know what? You can definitely make the argument even later. Um, he, you know, in in so much of the Cold War and, and in all of this, you know, decolonization struggle, people had these overlapping loyalties. And he wanted an independent Vietnam, period. Would he like to see it take at some point when when once once it was independent, would he like to see it take the form of a you know free market democracy or a communist one party state? He wasn't out there stressing that. I'm kind of reminded of somebody I did, we did an episode on earlier, a man named Joseph Pilsudski, who's kind of the father of modern Poland and if you look at the history, uh, his personal history, he had been a socialist. He had been member a member of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, which eventually turned into the Bolsheviks. And at this point, he, you know, he they have these, he has these competing goals, and he, you know, told his allies, his his former party comrades. Independence is where I get off because independence for Poland is more important for me than anything else. So for Ho Chi Minh, independence for Vietnam was more important than what form it wound up taking. Right. We, we, can, we can deal with that once we have that to deal with, right? Right. We, 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 need, we, need to be, we need to be independent before we can decide what that means and how we express that. And I think that's a good way of sort of summarizing it back. So I guess the first question, you know, we look, you know, we'll explore the what if, whether it's plausible or not, but I, I think it's worth asking the question because I think this is part of the reason that it did not happen. Was it even plausible to think that the United States would suggest to the French that they give up any of their colonial interests, but particularly a colonial interest like Indochina? Absolutely not. <laughs> even if this wasn't like, Again, very much this this mental image of somebody pushing a script at a Hollywood restaurant. No, it, I I I I don't think. And and uh, just to kind of you know give people some background, we are recording this right after we recorded another episode where we again talk about American involvement and uh, the Americans hadn't put enough skin in the game to to realistically go to the French and suggest they give up anything any territory france in this mindset was we're taking territory we're not giving up anything right and so i, I raise that to say I, I don't think it's a bad question and it, it's okay and fair enough to ask the historical what if because you know suddenly again we were talking about wilson's idealism he may have been just you know idealistic enough to give it a whirl and then realize you know his advisors and others telling him why he should not do it. But to me, of the two scenarios that the listener has suggested, I think the Wilson scenario is far less likely for the reasons that you've just expressed. There was no way that it was going to fly in 1919, 1920. I do think a slightly different scenario existed to some degree post-World War II for two reasons from my standpoint. One is the United States is in a different position after World War II than it was after World War I. And secondly, we're that much further down the historical road in terms of already seeing some of the issues that have happened as a result of colonialism globally. And I think the United States perhaps being a little bit more of a position to say, you know, this, in the end, this is something that we need to be working against and not propping up. At least that's just my take on it. I see the more likely of the two scenarios, if there would have been fertile ground for this idea of being Truman instead of Wilson. Absolutely. And, and I want to echo that. And, and um, I do agree with those two statements. And I also want to add one more thing, kind of the power dynamics here. Um in World War One, France was still a, I, I mean, Churchill 
the day Hitler came to power in 33 said, thank God for the French army. France in 1919 was still well respected, was still, they had, you know, they had won the war to a large extent. They had borne the cost of winning the war. So they got whatever they wanted. Um, there isn't really a, you know, World War II equivalent of Versailles, but, but when, that, when those discussions are going on, those p- French officers are arriving at the meeting in American-made jeeps, wearing American-made right. uniforms that we gave them. Uh, the dynamic has changed. Right. And, and you had already seen to some degree, we, we talked about this also, and I don't know if these episodes will end up being released back to back, the ones that we've recorded here back to back, but they certainly are related. You know, we, we spent a lot of time in one of the episodes here recently talking about you know, the situation in South Africa and the, and the British Empire. The, same, the British Empire is, is different even after World War II in terms of they're looking to, you know, divest and change the way it's not an empire anymore, it's becoming the Commonwealth. To me, that's that that's literally the way I think about it, right or wrong in my head, is the relationships are intentionally being changed because the realization of um, a colonial empire stance is not something that's going to be, it's not going to be a late 20th century fad. So that's one of the interesting things looking at, doing a bit of a deep dive to the um, Atlantic Charter. <laughs> The Atlantic Charter is the agreement between FDR and Churchill in August of 1941, uh, which on the surface of it establishes friendship and comedy between the special relationship and says a lot of nice things and doesn't necessarily do too much. Um, Depending upon how you read it, it's also Roosevelt saying, you know what, we're going to get into this. We'll come save your bacon. One of the things that America extracts, one of the things that America gets from the British is trading rights, is access to the imperial market, which is important, very important, because at this point, it's the beginnings of America looking at the British Empire and saying, we want, you know, we want a part of that. We want access to that. And we're going to use our current power to gain access to that. So I think, you know, those early Roosevelt negotiations, if you look at, you know, his diaries and what he's thinking and what he's doing, at this point, he realizes that the empires are on their way out and he is maneuvering to have the United States fill that vacuum in some way. Right. And to me, the other big difference between, you know, the end of the First World War, the end of the Second World War is by the by the end of the Second World War, and certainly it's going to it's going to become a very rapid thing that we notice and pay attention to is the idea that, you know, if you ask who Ho is, we mentioned we talked, you know, he certainly, um, you know, becomes and subscribes to communist ideals that that's a given. Mm-hmm. And that ultimately does happen, but I do agree with you. Even when he's a communist, he's a nationalist first. Um, but by the time we get to this second instance, the the prism through which everything is looked at globally is starting to move towards what will become the Cold War in terms of the the, the axes of power being the West versus the East in terms of um, um, capitalism versus communism and the struggle and the alignment globally and what were formerly colonial disputes are now ideological disputes that are still being overlaid on top of colonial and nationalistic disputes. Yes, yes. And so eventually, you know, supporting the French in Indochina, which the United States does, you alluded to that earlier, uh, the United States sort of inherits the situation in French Indochina, Vietnam, is they're doing that because not because they're really supporting French colonialism, but because they're, they view that as, as battling against the spread of communism. Right. And, and I think we discussed it a little bit on a previous episode we did on the Suez crisis, but the United States is, is, is kind of pulling two different things here because in some cases in Suez we're saying you know what Britain and France that is 
you're not getting away with playing this empire bit anymore. And yet in other places, we are basically buying that house sight unseen and just taking over as is. Right. And so let's explore the second scenario, since I think we both agree it would be maybe the more plausible scenario. So if we look at that scenario where Truman actually apparently, you know, in some of the reading I was doing, apparently he never even sees the letter that's supposedly sent to him, or there's never, not that he was unaware, <laughs> there was a situation in French Indochina, I, I think he was aware there was something going on there, but he, he never basically sees this request that comes, you know, asking the United States to intervene and to provide some assistance in, in, um, I'm going to use the term Vietnamese independence. I don't even know what term they would have necessarily used for themselves at that point, but in, in accomplishing that. So let's say that that lands on fertile ground and let's say that the United States is willing to engage in diplomacy or pressure or whatever it would involve to lead the French down the path of trying to set up a self-determination situation in what was so French Indochina at the time. I think I know a way to a, a, a very easy way to accomplish it. Um, okay. Vice President Henry Wallace. Elaborate. He had been he was vice president during I I want to say he was either FDR's second. I thought he was his 39th yeah. vice president. Didn't he have like 52 of them? <laughs> That's just, just, does it just seem that way, right? Somehow Somehow FDR, yes, somehow he was FDR's 39th vice president, <laughs> but the United States 52nd. Right. Somehow that worked out. Um, kind of a Grover Cleveland situation where they're not all, yeah. Um, he was the vice president of FDR for the majority of the war. He was elected at least in 1940. I want to say John Nance Gardner was the vice, John Nance Gardner was the vice president initially in 32 and i want to say was again in 36 yeah but yeah and, and, and you're correct wallace is the <laughs> is, is runs with runs with roosevelt in 40 the unprecedented third term given the circumstance yes. and truman is not until the 44 election and uh, there's all of this backroom stuff about truman becoming the 44 but let's say that Roosevelt stuck with Wallace just for this scenario. And the reason that's important is this. Wallace was a former secretary of agriculture. Um, and he was one of those people working with FDR to gain access for American goods to the British Commonwealth. He was one of those people who was out there saying these empires are on their way out and we need to fill the gap. So uh, under a Wallace, I feel like he's going to be receptive to somebody coming in and saying, hey, we'd like to be our own country rather than seeing, well, the French are on our side, aren't they? So if you're trying to get out of the French, you're against us. And what, you know, you understand what I'm saying? R Wallace would have had a more nuanced and, and was an open decolonizer. Right. And I, and I think generally considered to be you know, these terms vary over time, but probably a little bit more liberal in that respect than uh, than Truman was in terms of being being open to the idea of doing that. So if that Very happens, much. no, we're just we're just going to skip through a lot of detail here, which is tough to know exactly how it would have worked. But that's that's also the powerful thing we can do in what if history. So let's assume that either by hook or by crook, the United States is able to convince the French, persuade the French, threaten the French, whatever it takes to allow independence uh, without it being fought for as directly by, um, by the forces that were under Ho. Mm -hmm. We assume that Ho would have been thankful to the United States. And, yes. and so it would not have been antagonistic to the United States, even though ideologically there may have been differences there. So does this really avoid, <laughs> I guess my question is, again, thinking about this now, uh, from what I readily admit is a very narrow American perspective, does that ultimately actually avoid the United States involvement in Vietnam or would there probably have been something equivalent to that? It just wouldn't have been in Vietnam. It would have been in some other, you know, Southeast Asian nation. So we, we wouldn't be talking about the Vietnam War. We'd be talking about the Southeast Asian country X war that had the same impact on the United States as the Vietnam War did. Um, 
I feel like the the change could be this. Um, in you know, if you look at so much of the history of the Cold War, one of the problems that the American that the United States faced was we wanted you to say you were an American. Well, to some extent, we wanted you to say you were an American Democrat, and then we would support you. Um, I feel like if in Vietnam, and you did mention Wallace was on the, Wallace was out there. Wallace was a full-on progressive. He actually challenged Truman in 1948 from the left. Right. Um, so he's, he's very comfortable working with very progressive elements. And I think it would have been very powerful to show the third world we will work with you to become an independent nation and join the community of nations and you can decide your own internal like like we said you could come to that decision once you come to that decision once once you come to the point of how is your country going to be structured you can come to that decision when it comes to that point so kind of the United States being the power for nationalism and for Wilsonian self-determination. And, and I think if w the United States actually implements that, actually takes the side of we're going to move the colonial power out and support domestic nationalism, and if we take that route, we can take the legs out of a lot of the success the Soviet bloc had in the third world. That's assuming that we do that. That is not a safe assumption to me. <laughs> in, in too many places, you know, throughout the world, the United States took the interest of commercial interest over national independence interest. Right. So I'm thinking about, you know, right at the same time as the MVM Fu and, and the Geneva Accords, there's Guatemala, there's Cuba, where we have a long history of things going wrong. I mentioned earlier in it was it yes, it was in this episode, the the Belgians in the Congo. And and you know, we if the United States determines that we are our policy, our national goal is to move out European powers and move in. I think we might be able to prevent having a Vietnam War or, or something that is that jarring to the United States. I don't think we're set up for that. Yeah. I think somewhere we're going to say, oh, well, gee, they say nice things about us. They must be a local and they're who we want. And um, yeah, we'll get involved in the same thing again. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, it's, it's one of, to me, it's one of those challenges, particularly coming from an American mindset about what I want to believe, you know, American ideals are there and what I practically see. At the end of the day, you know, geopolitics is geopolitics. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it tends to trump a lot, you know, reality trumps ideology a lot. <laughs> Yeah. In fact, almost constantly. And so, uh, you know, while I think it's one of those nice concepts and, you know, you know I, I do really want to explore briefly here. What is, if you, if we were to have that, what you just described, highly unlikely thing happen, what does that mean? Um, I think it is highly unlikely, even in the second scenario where I think there could have been more, as you point out, with a different vice president, a different set of circumstances, more reception to the idea uh, it's it still is facing a very stiff headwind there uh, to make it happen, but even if it were to happen, you know we have this idea. Well, okay, okay, if you take if you take away the, the what it eventually became in the United States a lot of domestic strife over that conflict. Uh, you know, even if you remove that, there were other things that were going to happen inside the United States just because of domestic issues that probably would have pitted some of the same forces and ideologies against each other it just wouldn't have been around vietnam it would have been around some other subject if that makes any sense now, there would have been a substitute for vietnam like you say fill in 
one of 10 to 12 different candidates around the world that would have been the proxy discussion about what the United States should or should not be doing. I'm talking about from a domestic political standpoint that manifested itself in the, in the Vietnam, in protests, what we think of as being the Vietnam era. Well, I think one of the other things that, that's just shooting through my mind right now, if we take this completely out of the realm of um, world geopolitics, and we're just talking about U.S. politics and what is happening in the 1960s and the effects that the war in Vietnam has on American domestic politics, I'm thinking about a man named George Meany, who, and I, I promise I can explain who he is because not a lot of people know who that is. George Meany was the president of the AFL-CIO, and he was hard anti-communist. And when you look at what happened with how Vietnam played out, I think a lot of that, what is today the Rust Belt, and a lot of that um, that blue collar worker, to some extent, left the New Deal coalition over this, right? Over Vietnam, they were they were Nixon's great silent majority. They had been solid Roosevelt people. And, and, the, and if you think about all of the other changes that were brought about, the civil rights, the youth movement, all of these things, they were okay with. But the, anti, the war, the anti-war, I think, did help break down that New Deal coalition. I agree with that. And it, it, so it changed. This is one of those instances where, you know, is domestic politics changing international relations or foreign relations or the other way around? The answer is yes. They're always playing back and forth with each other. Right, right. And and so, you know, and again, it's, I think it's one of the, to me, it's one of the exciting things about why this podcast even exists. And when we talk about this is sometimes you think, you tend to want to think about a very linear change. If you just change this, you know, it changes that. And so you divert off there and it stays very linear, except that it doesn't. <laughs> Yeah, because, there, yeah. because there's a lot of forces at play there. So again, just ho getting a receptive audience, okay, that does change something. That may then that may change something, but doesn't have enough impetus to change bigger things. That the answer probably is no. But again, it's also the flip side of you know to me of alternate history is sometimes that small lever when it's flipped, the way that it dominoes across affects a lot more than you imagine for exactly the same reason you can't undo it is that yeah. if you've changed this one thing, you undo all kinds of other things because they're all interrelated. Right. And you know, in, in my mind, you know, just for example, the the economic pressures that are put domestically in the United States of trying to but aside from the social pressures and the political change that you just did a good job of describing there, but just the economic pressures of fighting a cold war on a lot of fronts, but also funding an actual, you know, shooting war in Asia, in the case of Vietnam, even though it's, you know, I guess technically it's, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a, I guess, what does it really go under? It goes under sort of the idea of, I guess, a police action in some way, although that's really what Korea is. It's a war, yeah. but it's not a war, right? Yeah. It's involved. It's the way you hear it, it's the U.S. involvement in Vietnam. Yeah. We call yeah. it the war, but, you know, it's, it's not formally declared in the sense of a formal declaration of war is, but that still had an economic impact. I mean, you know, the idea, I remember first time I ever heard guns and butter you know, as a concept and the, the idea that there were, there was money that was needed for domestic programs, the, you know, the, uh, the great society, but you also needed money for the Cold War expressed here in the hot sense and what's going on in Vietnam. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you can't, and that dollar can't be spent on both without creating an issue. So, again, not to, I really appreciate the, the topical suggestion uh, from Joey. Scale of one to 10, Chris, what is the likelihood of his first scenario you, in terms of even getting, uh, even getting uh, Wilson to give, give it the time of day? You give it a, a one meaning no way in the world, a 10 means certainly that could have happened. I, I, I'm going to give it a, a generous two to three. Um, I, I feel like you know what? Maybe you might have caught him on a good day. I don't know, but it, it, it's low. And for the second scenario in uh, 
with with Truman post the Second World War. Same scale. Um, I would say closer to seven, given the will, given the will on the part of the United States to recognize that and to tell the French to sit down and shut up. Um, you know, it's we didn't talk about this, but that's going to create problems for us in Europe, in NATO, um, which even though it's kind of an ossified is, you know, a big front in the Cold War. Um, maybe you have the French doing more things like they did with the British and Suez. They're a little harder for us to deal with. Um, but the thing is, if you look at, you know, the, the situation on the ground in April 1945, when the war is over, when the first troops go into Indochina, if they're not Americans, they're there because the Americans want them there. We allow them there. Right. We, and that power dynamic has changed completely. And it, it, it's a matter of does the United States want that to happen? And if they do, it's going to happen. I agree. Cool. Do you think we missed anything on Joey's question? Anything that we ought to hit that, that crossed your mind that we didn't as we went down the path? Um, I was thinking a little bit. I, I just threw out that European situation. Um, I, you know, we, France experienced a lot of internal dissent and problems, somewhat over Indochina, but especially over Algeria. Right. Come 1960. I mean, you literally had... You had a military, multiple military coups being plotted in a NATO member. Um, and I think that's something worth exploring in terms of would that have caused more dissension and would that have caused trouble for us on the ground in Europe? I, 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 I understand why Truman does what he does because in their mind, the fold of gap is more important than food buy. And you can't do everything everywhere, so you have to pick your battles and choose your priorities. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I agree with that as well. Well, good. Well, we certainly appreciate Joey doing what he did, which is suggest a topic. And as we've talked about a number of times here, that's one of the things we hope to do more <laughs> as we move forward here on A Fork in Time. Uh, go to the Go to the website, that's www.aforkintimepodcast.com. The A is important. The podcast is important to get you to where you need to get to there. And you'll find a number of different ways to provide feedback, which we certainly welcome. Uh, and we find all the feedback constructive, even when it may have a sense of being critical. Uh, that's what it's there for as well. But certainly the idea of suggesting topics, because uh, the topic screen that I literally see in front of me right now has things on it that I would not have come to probably ever and some of them are also uh, pretty interesting. And of course, as we talked about a couple of times here, and I know Chris echoes this, but part of the reason Chris is a regular contributor on the show is he brings a perspective and a part of the world that is thinking about differently than I do and that Alexis does, is this idea of we want to expand our scope geographically and we want to expand our scope temporally. So going to different places and going to different times than we often do. Uh, it is part of what we definitely want to be about as we continue to, to advance the podcast forward. We're coming up really close, Chris, on episode 100. I was looking at that the other day, and it's hard for me to believe. I guess I had a dream that it would last that long. I hoped that it would, but actually seeing it come to reality now is something that's uh, starting to get me a little bit excited. Great. So um, I'm right. looking forward to that. You know what? Anything else? That's, you that's, I think that's what we might need to do. I think episode 100 might be when I finally say we can stop World War II. Ooh, I, I want to see if we can do it. I will reserve that slot for you, Chris. <laughs> but that also puts you under the clock because we're getting really close to yeah, it. So, uh, so know. we'll get there. One of the things I do want to tease and look forward to is Chris has, uh, has already agreed to and we'll be taking on some solo episodes on his own and with others that he knows. So uh, those are part of what's coming out here. And also just remind our listeners that, you know, if you have some ideas and some suggestions, you too can find yourself talking into a microphone and being part of what we do here. We welcome uh, uh, guests and co-hosts as well. So again, all of that information can be found on the website. If you enjoy the podcast, uh, let others know about it. There's links to our social media aspects that are there, easy to share episodes, our entire back catalog. 
If you feel so inclined, you're capable of doing so. The opportunity to support the podcast financially or monetarily also exists there through Patreon. Uh, but most importantly, we just want to say thank you for giving us your time and your attention because we know there's tons of things uh, that could draw that. And it's not Don and Chris and Alexis and Brant and all kinds of other folks that we've uh, that we've introduced here talking to you about history, but um, we're, pre we're appreciative that that you enjoy hearing us and giving us the feedback. That's a big part of what this is about is building a community as Alexis and I have said uh, pretty much since the start of the podcast. Chris, you have anything you want to tell the listeners or talk to the listeners about? Not particularly. I think you summed it up pretty well. All right. Good deal. So uh, again, we appreciate your time and your attention. We're going to sign off for this episode of A Fork in Time. And as we do so, we're going to remind you, as we always do, our suggestion is if you just so happen across that fork in time, maybe a good idea would be, you know, take it. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Learn more about the podcast at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Join us next time.